Well, Andrew, uh, well, thank you very much for joining us. I know we've known each other for a long time, and uh, I just uh, really appreciate you being here on the journey. And um, I uh, have been uh, hosting this now for uh, for a few weeks and um, have an opportunity for some great guests. So I really look forward to having you on today. And um, so so as we, uh, as you just maybe tell us a little bit about who you are, but before we kind of jump into that, like what does Andrew do when if he's not, you know, I know you're heavily involved with theater and, and, and you're a dancer as well as instructor, but what do you do for fun? What, what do you do to just have, just have fun? Oh, for fun. Um, well, I'm a, I'm a huge game nerd as anyone who knows me well knows. So I love days at home, just gaming for hours on end. If, if I have those hours to give, um, I love movies, going to the movies with friends, um, at a point in life where I don't have a lot of friends. Sure. So, so the few friends I do have, we sure. can pretty much do anything boring, hanging at the mall for however long I, I'm weird that I can get a lot out of a little. Uh-huh. So okay. just simple stuff like that. People are like, Oh, it's boring. I'll look forward to it. Sure. Sure. But it is, it is interesting, isn't it? As we get older, that we go from high school, young adult years where there's, we're always around a bunch of people and things like that. And then as we, as we grow more into adulthood, that, that our worlds in that way become maybe a little bit smaller, a little bit more mm-hmm. select. So it is, it is interesting how that is. It is. And, it's weird. And so then that, that quality of time is, um, you, you know, so much more important. Mm-hmm. So, so gaming, I, I didn't, that I didn't know about you. So, so what kind of gaming do you do? What's, uh, oh, what don't I do? Um, so it, Mad, so like Madden 2019. Um, no, I look like a Madden person. <laughs> That's exactly what no, I'm wondering. <laughs> no, no, I I'm definitely an RPG person. Okay. Um, if anyone knows what strategy RPGs are, those are my those are my niche. So RPG stands for role playing game. Oh, role playing game. Okay. Um, so they're the more like fantasy, hyper fantasy, gotcha. those kinds okay. of games. My okay. siblings and I have a a yearly thing where at Christmas we'll buy each other video games and see who can buy a game that takes the longest for oh. someone to beat. Okay. They've never been able to find a game that takes me okay. too long to to beat. Okay, okay. Well, that may also have to do with uh, some of this diligence that you have. And, Maybe. And the, there it is. And this persistence. There it is, yes. So you may yes. have some other family members that call that being stubborn. <laughs> right? so, uh, so so, tell us uh, a little bit about uh, about you. As I mentioned, that you know, you, you're a co-owner of Gateway Performing Arts. Um, you've been a dancer and, and a performer and an artist and a writer, and you've been doing this for an extended period of time. But how did you originally get into into the arts, and what what modality of arts was that? Um, the first area of arts that I got into is definitely singing. Uh, my mom was a uh, professional singer from pretty much the time I was born, so it was something that I was kind of born into. Um, you know, we don't necessarily take on all the traits of our parents, but that was definitely one gifting that, that I did get okay. from my mother was, was music, and my father's an instrumentalist as well. So at... Oh, I think I was seven, seven or eight when I auditioned for my first professional theater company, and that okay. was a company that my mom was with, okay. and got in. So started theater really young, mm-hmm. um, fell in love with that definitely first. It was probably my first love in the arts was was theater and singing, and um, grew up singing in church. Obviously, uh, hated piano. That always shocks people to know I hated piano when I was young. Okay. Mom got me into lessons young, Start literally hated it. Uh, it was like pulling teeth to get me to practice. I did not come back to it until college because you have to as a vocal major sure. and a, uh, in theater and ended up re-falling in love with it and music and that's kind of where the becoming a composer came in was okay. not till college sure um when going back to when you were younger and that you disliked it you hated piano what what, what do you think that was about what yeah. what was what, what do you think that uh i think a lot of it had to do with growing up i was very add okay like very add um 
still obviously have it, but um, I mean, it was it was really bad then, and I think it was just the you have to sit down for a certain period of time, and it's a very focused task, and it's focused for your hands, it's focused for your brain, it's focused for your eyes, all of that. I think it was, I think that was asking a little too much of me mm-hmm. at, at that point in time. I, I was a kid who was flipping off the couch and, sure. you know, okay. could run up, would literally crawl up the walls and run up the walls in the hallway like I was. Sure, I was that kid. So, and I don't play an instrument, but I would, I would think with like many things uh, so I'm much more know a lot more about sports and sports development and that but I would think from a, from learning how to play piano there's certain basic things that you have to fundamentally learn how to do mm-hmm. before you can then go to that next level and that next level being able to be creative or expressive you just have to learn the basics yep. and and so that's what you're saying is that at that time period because of how uh, the maturity level where you how your brain was processing information how your mind was processing things that that just was more of a turn off mm-hmm. it was more of a chore than it was yep. um, an opportunity yep it moved too slow I mean you know again thinking singing and um, I started gymnastics when I was about six all of those things theater um, I started drawing very young too that you get to go at your own pace so you okay. do get to go fast and okay. you can be spread out and and, you know, art, um, fine art as far as painting and drawing and that kind of stuff, you get to do it at your own tempo. So if I got bored, it was nothing to get up and go do something else and not okay. come back to it okay. know, till another day. Okay. You know, the reason why I think this is this piece right here is important because I know I remember being a parent uh, with with Caleb and Sierra being really young and wanting them, you know, wanting the best for them and wanting them to explore things. And I remember Caleb, uh, who doesn't have doesn't have attention deficit problems, but I remember being introducing him to baseball early on because he his cousin played baseball, so he thought he wanted to play baseball. And I remember him going in, and this is early grade school, and it was so much much more of standing in line and waiting, it drove him crazy. Yeah. And he came home from the first practice, he goes, I don't, I'm done, I don't want to do that again. And then it was another sport that he did. It was, it was a similar type of thing where it was so, um, because he was trying to teach the skill level of it, that it just wasn't a right fit be- where his development was. Mm-hmm. And then where with um, with wrestling and with, with football, because it was different, and it wasn't as much about those particular skill developments, and there could be more room for um, movement. Yeah. And they wasn't standing in line. He was drawn to those. And so it sounds like it was similar to you with, with the arts. And I think that's important because so many times as parents, we want what's best for our kids. And we think we can see where they're going to go with this. Mm-hmm. And maybe they're right, like in your case. It just was, you know, a couple years later. Yep, maybe uh, two, two. Yep. A couple decades later, or at least yeah. a decade later, right? And, um, and that, I think that's important to keep that in mind um, and just listening to your story that it was just too soon. It wasn't that it was the wrong right. instrument. Uh, with the the wrong modality, but it was just too soon, and um, and you had to get um, more of uh, intrigued by the the bug of theater and and the singing specifically. Yep. So what was it like being on stage as a performer, and and what it, what was it about that that um, you enjoyed so much early on, and um, and then maybe even as you went into young adulthood? I think not much has changed from okay. from what it was when I was young to what it is now it was um, it was the place where Andrew was important okay. being on stage okay you know audiences were looking at me mm-hmm. and it wasn't in a at least from from me the great thing about being on stage is you you don't know what the audience is thinking so even if they are thinking negatively towards you you have no clue because mm. there's no actual interaction other than you know applauses and Laughter boos whatever, but yeah. how many people actually boo at theater right. anymore sure, right. um so you know, if they are judging you or judging your performance or whatever, you don't know. So you get okay. to walk away feeling like, oh, that was a great performance. Yeah. That was awesome. Did yeah. you hear that applause? Yes, I got the yeah. applause. Done. Yeah. You know, and as a kid, 
that was really important to me that I just got to be on stage. People were applauding me, so that meant people liked me. That mm. meant people um, approved of me mm. and, and my abilities and what I could do. And that built me up and allowed me to at least have a place where I could go and get built up, mm -hmm. even if I wasn't getting that, you know, in other areas of my life. Okay. It, was, it, it really is a, I've called it a theater, a, a sanctuary and a shelter since okay. since I was pretty young, and, okay. and that's what it is. Okay. And so you kind of went there a little bit, right? So if, if, if theater was the sanctuary, then that almost implies that there was other places that were less than a sanctuary. Sure. Less than a sanctuary. <laughs> so, so uh, and, and you probably could come up with a, a, a more creative word for that. But uh, uh, what, what, so kind of tell us a little bit about what that was. If, if, if theater was that sanctuary, where that safe place where you got that um, affirmation um, for, for what you were doing and who you were, um, what was going on in other time periods? And now we're, we're talking late grade school, middle school, and high school. What, what was going on in other places? Um, well, before the, you know, grade school, middle school and, and all of that hit. My very first memory of life was being molested as a child. Mm -hmm. That is the very first memory that I have. Okay. No one should have that as their no. you know, very first no, memory no, no. ever. No. Um, but I was that young to where you know memories weren't that um, when I explain it to people, I explain it like a computer. You know, I'd already been built at the factory and shipped, but I hadn't been, the memory hadn't been turned on yet. Nothing right. had been saved yet. Yeah. So there, there were no memories saved yet. And that was the thing that turned, you know, the memory bank on and that okay. kind of thing. And that, how old were you? Know, um, five, six, somewhere okay. around there. Okay. So, and, you know, that's literally as far back as I can remember. That's, sure. that's, that's the first thing. And that sadly shaped much of my young life. And um, from there, around nine, I knew um, that I liked boys, which... You know, when you already grow up feeling like you're wrong and ruined and you grow up in really conservative areas where the thought of being gay is attacked and, and I mean, you're, you're told very young that that's a wrong thing, so that was already in my head. So then on top of that, you had that now. Mm -hmm. And then it was shortly thereafter, um, round 11, when um, I started being picked on and bullied by uh, some boys at actually the um, gymnastics center that I was training at. Okay. And that's, that, that was the first instance in my life of bullying. And it was three boys and started, you know, it started the whole boys will be boys, you know, whatever. So that was the excuse that if, if you told, did you tell someone? Yep. Okay. Yep. And, tried and telling one coach and it was the whole, you know, that's just, you know, boys around your age, you have to just let it be and blah, blah, blah. And, okay. and it, um, got worse um, just Physi with those boys it got physical worse. verbal both verbal it hadn't gotten physical um, with them um, as physical as they would get is they would follow me in the bathroom and kind of shake the stall while I was in there so intimidation um, type stuff. definitely the intimidation yeah. stuff yeah. Um, and you know they used some really colorful language towards me in their okay. bullying and again to hear that kind of stuff that young on top of again it was just adding layers on top of the feeling already that I was trash and that I was wrong and that just kind of started okay. progressing and okay. and becoming thicker and heavier and um, you know, by by eleven, twelve, I'd been doing the theater, um, the professional theater company for about three years already, three or four years. So, it became that much more of an important okay. aspect of my life. Um, and I love gymnastics, and that was um, 
kind of an outlet for me too. Um, by that time, I had a coach who would then be my coach until I was almost 20 years old. Mm -hmm. And uh, amazing man who really did think a lot of me. Mm -hmm. And so that was another place that I could um, go to to be important and special. Mm -hmm. Even from a young age, he he specifically kind of scouted me into his um, specific competitive teams, and that that was some validation for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was important, but the bullying that I hoped and thought would end there ended up then showing up at school by, at about 13, 14. So, so up until that point, you hadn't really hadn't experienced the bullying at school, mm -hmm. in grade school, early middle school. It was just in this this window of time when you were involved with this this <clears throat> secondary sanctuary, mm -hmm. right, um, with the gymnastic, um with the team. And, and I imagine that, I know for me, is, again with the sports is that there's some huge benefits of competition and and it's like I mean I've come to realize this now I definitely didn't realize it then um, but the outcome whatever place you get in gymnastics or whatever it may be is less important than what you get out of the preparation what you get out of the mm -hmm. event what you get out of what um, what you were able to push yourself through yep. um, and I think to count Dick that piece, you know, whatever that story was that you were telling yourself about being trash and being less than. Now, if you could compete and 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 perform at a level that you know it's called social learning. When we we look and see how are we doing compared to other people, and and obviously you're matching up to a level that um, you're excelling at it. Yeah. Right? And, and so then after, or, or a continuation of the bullying, different people, different different individuals, now it's happening in middle school so it, or, or school. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's like, okay, it's not just unique to these, these three boys or right. whatever. Um, so yeah, tell us a little bit about what, what was different there? What Did something change with that going when it was started happening at school? Because obviously when you're at school, it's longer periods of time. Mm -hmm. um, Definitely more concentrated. <clears throat> um, it then became not only some of the boys my age, but older. Because you okay. you're all at the same school at the same time, so a couple grades above. Um, Pretty much it started for the same reasons. I was always really small um, and always have been more uh, effeminate. Okay. So kind of an easy target, sure. you know, for that kind of thing. And, you know, when you're going to a school that is mostly, again, Christian and the more blind you know side of the the judgmental side of the christianity um you know because that's how their parents behave naturally that's how those kids behave and that's kind of how they were so again it started with the comments and the verbal and, and that kind of stuff and then from there it that was the first time that it in my life it started becoming physical and then you know getting pushed around here and there then it would be a you know shove into a wall or um, I was thrown down a hill at one point by a much larger boy um, down onto it was a concrete um, walkway down at the bottom of this hill and, and that's where I had been thrown down onto um, the worst though probably the most like strong memory I have of the physical bullying in my brain was uh, again I I was terrified to go to the bathroom because mm -hmm. that was the most unsafe place that I could be, mm -hmm. you know, because it was very easy to be followed into, mm -hmm. you know, a bathroom, and I have been on multiple occasions. Um, that was where the intimidation was happening. And that, yeah. yeah. And so, yeah. because that started young, there was already a fear to, sure. you yeah. know, go to the bathroom yeah. at school. And uh, probably the worst point was, um, was in the stall, because I... 
Um, I actually stopped using urinals at about 10, mm -hmm. 10 years old. I would always, still, I always go into a stall. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter. It's just like a safety thing. Perceived safety, more safe. Yeah. 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 And um, there was one day where um, a couple of boys had followed me, and I'd actually left class uh, in the middle of class to use the bathroom because mm -hmm. I would try not to use the bathroom as much as possible. During class, passing periods and stuff, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and it was during class I had excused myself thinking, no one's going to be in there, whatever. Um, and there were a couple boys, and um, they started doing the whole stall thing and whatever. And next thing I know, one of them reaches under the stall, grabs my ankles, and pulls them out from underneath me. And I'd fallen into mm. the toilet and hit my head. Um, and so, you know, you're laying there on the floor of a bathroom. Mm -hmm. and, you know, you really can't get too much more vulnerable and afraid and exposed than a moment like that at school where you should be safe. Mm -hmm. You know, as a young person. Um, and it just kind of stayed pretty much in that in that place and in that mode till um, almost my senior year of high school. And on top of that then started the um, well I should say continued but it got more Again, saturated were the gay slurs and that kind of stuff, mm. um, to which they could then add that the boys at the gymnastics academy didn't. Um, those students then started adding the um, hate and the the you know shaming, the the Christian shaming that mm. you know that God hated me and that you know. Okay. hell was coming and that okay. kind of stuff for me okay. on top and again when you grow up in church because my dad's a pastor um, I always had this close relationship with the Lord and then all of a sudden through high school it was questioning well I love you but apparently you don't love me mm -hmm. so that added a condemnation and shame aspect mm -hmm. to the bullying that um, doesn't always happen, you know, right. for people. So it wasn't just the now physical fear and the emotional fear. It was now the the spiritual fear, mm -hmm. you know, that that am I if I die today, would I really go to hell just because right. of this one thing? You know, I think just speaking to what you just said, I think I know for me that was a struggle when growing up. I always had a, 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 an understanding, feeling, a sense of God, um, and so when I then, of course, then hear the Jesus story, and and then hear all the stories that go along with that, that are age appropriate when you're in you know early grade school or even before, um, it just okay, it made sense. I just mm -hmm. okay, I, I get it, you know, and and then. It wasn't until later, though, it, it, well, that I started recognizing that religion had to do with people right. than trying to talk about this thing that I already was feeling. And and so um, so what I'm hearing you say, and you correct me if, if it doesn't fit, but it was religious abuse mm -hmm. that was happening because it was people. It wasn't necessarily from God that was doing it, but it was right. just people who said they were representing yep. God or Christianity or, or, or whatever in their own agendas, their own belief systems. But spiritually, you still, now you're in this how do you differentiate? And, right. and um, you, you said something earlier too that I, I I think it's important for people to to know. I know as I've learned about it is why do we remember those type of details so vividly? Like mm -hmm. you know your first memory being uh, sexually abused at, at four or five years old, and um, like you said before, there was things that happened in your life, but there was no. Um, you know, like on a computer, there's a a, a, short, uh, a shortcut, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and and I think when we have emotional trauma, it it causes us to have that uh, bookmark or that shortcut yeah. to to that memory. And so, and and then what feeds that is then the story that we tell ourselves. Yeah. You said numerous times today that you know out of that because this event happened, then I must be trash or I must be less than. And so our our physically 
hopefully our bodies heal, you know, regardless of how long that abuse happened, if right. it was one time or if it was over an extended period of time. But emotionally, because we continue to tell the story to ourselves and we don't have some kind of intervention that that breaks that story up, um, I think that's why we keep going. It's natural and human for us to keep going back to that right. and then believing that message. Yeah. And sometimes it's from the perpetrator. Um, sometimes it's from our own piecing two things together and well this must be the conclusion because right. if I if I if if I wasn't trash and this wouldn't have happened to me or, or whatever it was. Um, but it also is the beginning of a falsehood, of a lie. Um, because as you mentioned before, you knew God before this, right. and, and of course afterwards. Um, so there, there's this, there's a contradiction there. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't necessarily mean the message goes away just because right. this, this, there's contradicting piece. And then, you know, already thinking that okay, okay, this is this is different. Um, drawn drawn to attracted to to boys okay this is going to be okay this is different than what's on tv or, right. or whatever at the time right. um so with the, all this going on t tell us a little bit more about how did the arts and i know you know i know that you're involved with a lot of different types of art right and um you know from writing to performing to singing uh composing um it's probably an unfair question to ask if you have a favorite, <laughs> but I'll ask: Do you have a favorite, um, or is it a favorite for a time? <laughs> I think it's a I, I think it's a favorite for a time, or okay. I think it's a favorite depending on where I'm at emotionally. Okay. Because each each flavor of art, color of art yeah. um, that I do, kind of feeds a different aspect of me. Okay. So. You know, depending on what kind of day I've had, or week I've had, or or something, um, something will spark in my brain and go. I, I need to go sit at the piano and, and mm -hmm. compose something. I need to put this into, right. you know, music, or I need to go draw something right now. Um, my brain has learned. Um, probably brain slash heart has has learned how to trigger what depending on what it needs mm -hmm. to where I don't even have to think about it. Mm -hmm. I'll just literally get this urge where I'm like, I need a pencil and piece of paper right now. I need to sketch something. I just need to sketch something. So, so similar to when you were little, was, okay, I'm done with this. Now i got to move on to something else. Yep. It's it's still following that intuition, that heart part regarding what you need at that time. Yep. I want to go a little bit back to your story. So we got the bullying's happening. It's it's definitely increased. It's intensified. We have the religious abuse happening um, as well um, because it sounds like you're going to a Christian private at school, mm -hmm. and um, and so that's going on. So so we fast forward to uh, you graduate right, from high school. What now? You're into adulthood. How this this of course just ends, right? Because everything just gets better oh, yeah, once you graduate, totally. right? Yeah, <laughs> so, all just fixed. Yeah. <laughs> There's nothing. So so what what happens as you're going into young adulthood? And and obviously it's different, right? And so you don't have to worry necessarily about going to the school bathroom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, but, but what what things how is how or if does this continue this perception um, continue into young adulthood I definitely still battled the perception uh, to an extent um, the bullying again like you said you know didn't continue at school because um, I then went to Rack Valley um, actually did uh, Rack Valley my senior year as well so I kind of got to start escaping from you know that that high school um, but it changed and transformed um, adults have a different way of bullying you know they have a different way of still making you feel less than, mm. um, less than them, less important than them, or less um, able. In the arts, it becomes you're less talented than them, or you're not talented enough for, you know, the career that you're going into, or where you're at. Um, so it 
shifted from bullying to more intimidation as I went into college and started in a, a vocal performance department. Um, there was definitely a sense from certain people that, you know, why are you here? You're not good enough, you're not of the caliber, you're not that kind of thing. And um, and then and, and what would the what would be their I guess excuse of why that was that um, was that because of them assuming that you were homosexual is that or or was it because of some other what what would be the reason why the you picked up on that perception that they thought you weren't good enough or they may even said that um, I really don't think they needed a reason mm. you know um, thankfully in the Arts, once you get out of high school and, and middle school, um, it's far more accepting of, you know, different kinds of people. So whether mm. you're gay, straight, bisexual, whatever. Mm. Um, so that I actually started finding some real acceptance. Okay. Um, just in, you know, those circles. Um, but um, a, a lot of it, when we... Like when uh, I talk to students now, um, other students who are dealing with that kind of intimidation from other people in the arts, it really does come down to an, uh, a jealousy thing or it can come down to they feel intimidated, they've kind of been the top dog in that area or whatever, and someone okay. else comes in and other people are talking about them and okay. what potential they have, and so they, they want to, you know, cut that down real fast before okay. you get to their level. Okay. Um, so I had to figure out how to battle through that, and thankfully, um, and this started in middle school and high school, I had specific teachers, um, and they were all arts teachers. Sure. I had a drawing teacher who really, really spoke into my life a lot in at that school where I was being so horribly bullied and that's where the love of then drawing came in was because of um, uh, two teachers. I only had one though for two semesters and then I had one for many years and those two women really, really spoken to me as an artist, whereas before I just kind of drew because I liked it. Mm -hmm. And and they spoke into me and said, no, you're, you're really gifted. It's not mm -hmm. just a talent that you have. This is a gift. Mm -hmm. and, and you should really build into this. And being told that I had a gift was something new and different, that it wasn't just a talent that I have. Because in the arts, um, those are two words that are, are thrown around simultaneously simultaneously you either have a talent or a gift mm -hmm. you know a talent is just an ability that you have whereas a gift is that that something extra that spark that separates you know the people who are good at what they do and the people who are great or excellent or have the potential to become excellent right. or great um, and oftentimes that can be used harmfully mm -hmm. you know right. and and I was very lucky to have those teachers who spoke into me that I had a gift and, and an ability and it was my junior year that our uh, choral director who was actually my mom on staff there so she definitely still spoke into me um, musically but she brought in a choreographer for um, our musical my junior year who was one of the head choreographers and dance teachers at the Rockford Dance Company at that okay. point in time Jill Beardsley and she came in to just work with us on one number one simple dance number and after that rehearsal, it was just with me and one other gal. She said, you know, I really think you could be a dancer. Mm -hmm. You you have you you have something in you, mm -hmm. but I really think you could be a dancer. And I never ever had that spoken into me because up till then I was always a kid who had to stare at his feet while he did choreography because sure. I couldn't remember and mm -hmm. was a little clumsy and and to have this Rockford Dance Company teacher look at me and go, I think you could be a dancer mm -hmm. sparked something new in me and and my senior year then I did a musical outside of my school and she just happened to be the choreographer. Um and she took me on as a private student. She said, no, 
you're going to be a dancer. We're going to make you a dancer. Okay. And that single woman, again, you know, took one teacher to mm-hmm. speak into me and, and not care about any other aspect of me, but saw worth in me. And that sure. hooked me, obviously, as a di- into dance, but, but also um, as a person, mm-hmm. you know, getting fed. So despite the bullying, despite the everything, I was very grateful that... God put these specific people in my life, but that those people actually rose up and did that for me. Mm-hmm. You know, it's very easy to, when you get a gut instinct to, to speak into someone's life or go and talk to that person to say, who am I to whatever, or whatever. Yeah. it's just a chance, yeah. whatever, it's just some weird feeling that I yeah. have, it's probably nothing. That those specific individuals did that and stepped up. Yeah. Um, they saved me. Yeah. They got me through middle school and high school. Yeah. And I really don't know without those specific people um, if I would have gotten through. Sure. You know, it's interesting as you talk, and, and, and at the very beginning when we started this podcast, I, um, Dalton and I uh, uh, talked about the hero's journey, and and that's something that with Joseph Campbell I've been um, intrigued by and followed and uh, and prescribed to um, for extended years. And it's interesting as I'm listening to you talk, right? So you have this wound that happens that, that had nothing to do with you. And the part that that carried on afterwards was the story that you continue to tell yourself because this wound happened mm-hmm. of being abused, and and then and then coming to that place that that being gay wasn't about being broken; it was just about how you were created, and and and, and I imagine wrestling with that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, interestingly enough, because of your mom, because of your family being musically inclined and always involved with that, there was building in this foundational sanctuary um, so there's this light in the darkness all along but there were some specific people in your life that intervened and counterdicted the original storyline that was yep. being told because of the abuse and the ones that you continue to follow and look for data to support um, that's what we do as humans right. right we look to support the belief that we already have yep. um, and and but they said no you have a gift um, gymnastics art later than dancing and then the thing about dancing that seemed to be so important as I'm listening to you was because it was something that you didn't think would be in your right. your wheelhouse some, uh, that, that you were going to be um, better than you know just maybe average at best right, right. so um, now now the other part of is I know you you do a lot about giving back I mean you're an instructor now yourself you, you've directed you've written um, you have a you have another um, musical coming up right mm-hmm. color of hope colors of hope yep. colors of hope and and so tell tell us a little bit about colors of hope and um, about what What's the storyline about, and why is this um, an important piece? Because this is coming up here soon. Um, Very soon. Uh, and, um, and so tell us a little bit about because I know this is one of those ways, it's one of many ways um, that you give back and, and provide an opportunity for you to speak into someone else, um, the audience, but then also um, give back um, when it comes to individual performers. So tell us a little bit about um, Colors of Hope. Um, well, I technically started writing Colors of Hope at about 16 without knowing that I was writing it. Um, I never thought I would be a writer. That okay. was even more so than dance. That was the one gift I never thought I would have. Um, I was, uh, I am severely dyslexic. And so writing, grammar, spelling were my the worst mm-hmm. things for me in school. Um, so I was never told that I was a good writer, that I would have a gift for writing. It was never even on my radar. Um, but at 16, one of my very good friends in high school um, passed away from ovarian cancer. We went to school together. We'd known each other for um, quite a few years at school um, before she um, lost her life. And I wrote... It was the first time I'd ever written anything out of emotion. Mm -hmm. I, when I got the news, 
I just went to my room and um, first cried for a long time. And then for some reason just felt like I needed to write out what I was feeling and I wrote um, the words to uh, a song that is still in the show called I Am Brave and it was kind of just writing how Elizabeth lived even though she was so young she was um, two years older than I was she lived so much more fully than most adults mm -hmm. that I still know mm -hmm. do. And so I just kind of wrote out these words and left it there and I still have the original notebook that I wrote it in so long ago. I never thought anything of it, didn't touch it. Got to college and started taking music theory and fell in love with music and, and the the beast that it was mm -hmm. and and found that I had an ability for it and again had a teacher pull me aside after a class and go I think you could write mm -hmm. I think you could write music you really really you grasp this you have a, a, a vision for this you have an ear for this and he said that's rare there mm -hmm. aren't a lot of composers in the world there are writers who we think of as writers who write you know the basic chord structure of a song mm -hmm. or write the lyrics for strong song but he said there are very few composers and um, so he really started working with me a lot on composing and ended up um, taking a lot of uh, symphony composing uh, class work with him and fell in love with that and by that time I had lost um, two other very important people in my life to two different forms of cancer and for each one of them, it was it was strange looking back again, not thinking that I was a writer. Um, that the day I found out each of them had passed, I'd done the same thing. I pulled out that same notebook and I'd, I'd written a series of lyrics um, for two new songs, completely different songs. Didn't know they were songs yet. They were just mm -hmm. words to me. Sure. And um, I... Started then after college experimenting with this idea of writing and those were some of the first lyrics that I had written that I went back to and thought maybe I could turn this into music and a song and next thing I knew I had written about seven songs now and started writing a story and decided to make good on something that um, my dear friend Anne Humphreys before she passed uh, she was one of my art teachers um, asked me if one day I would write her story. She did not know I was a writer, didn't know that I had any desire to be a writer. I'd never given a hint that I wanted to be a writer. And it was like all of a sudden, it, it really was one of those movie moments where you know, you have this like tunnel vision, all of a sudden you remember back to mm -hmm. when you were young and, and all of these things that you missed that you didn't know were leading you to a certain thing and it just hit me oh my god I want to be a writer yeah. I think I can be a writer mm -hmm. and so I started writing I started writing dialogue never written a script in my entire life and the first version was deplorable it was mm -hmm. awful but I wrote it and I couldn't let it go and so I kept writing it and rewriting it and rewriting it and um, this is probably rewrite number 24 Okay, but um I really, really finally hit a note with it, and a lot of that has to do with kind of where I am in my life, that I am far more open now as a person, and I am far more brave as a person, and unafraid to just be me, and unafraid to talk about, mm -hmm. you know, my past and things that I've gone through, knowing now that it's not weakness and that it doesn't make me trash that it actually makes me strong and capable and more mm -hmm. capable of speaking into other people's lives so that hopefully they don't have to go as far as I did into that dark before they actually realize that there there is a light there because mm -hmm. um, it took me a very long time yeah. and so 
I wrote this story to honor her, um, to honor the other people that I've lost. I've lost over 11 people in my life to cancer, and um, it's their story. It's it, it is sad, but it it does have laughter and it does have hope and. Um, it focuses on five individuals who are all diagnosed with five different forms of cancer at five different um, points in their life. And it focuses on how one central character, Timothy Hopkins, who I wrote after um, Elizabeth Hopkins, my friend that I okay. lost in high school, how his journey to find hope specifically causes ripples that affect the people around him, the nurses and the doctors, in positive and wonderful ways, and um, his loved ones and the people around him that these other four patients after him that actually um, their stories happened in different timelines after him mm -hmm. are still being affected by his ripples right. and they in turn find hope and find light and laughter because of his journey um, so that's kind of my paying homage to the people in my life who were those lights who didn't even know they were being that right. and didn't even I didn't even know at that time that they were causing ripples that would end up later helping me find hope and light in myself mm -hmm. and to be able to move on from all of the damage that I'd gone through um, you know up till 20 21 years old mm -hmm. then I finally got to a place where I was like you know I'm going to reach out for help. Mm -hmm. yeah. I deserve help. I deserve mm -hmm. to get out of this. Mm -hmm. 21 years of telling yourself you're trash and nothing is mm -hmm. 21 years too long. Right, right. You know, and so now, like with this show and um, the books that I write and the children's books that I write, and uh, like we talked about my blog, mm -hmm. I purpose to try to be that same kind of light that hopefully, you know, it might not change your world right now. All of a sudden, boom, something I say, just all of a, oh yeah, that's mm -hmm. it, that's sure. it. Yeah. Everything's better. But hopefully it'll, you know, stick a seed down in there that years later will help you get through mm -hmm. something so that you don't get to that really dark place that I know very well and that mm -hmm. no one should, yeah. no one should get to. Yeah, you know, it, I think the what you were just talking about the idea of you know, in your case being sexually abused as a young as a child, a small child, and that in itself, that wound, that, that thing that happens, um, it, it, it's that in itself is is so detrimental, and, and then the, all the things, right, all the storylines that go afterwards, is the is the piece that we have to eventually come to. We're going to wrestle with it one way or another, and 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 if we if we don't attack that dragon that that comes with the afterline of that story, it still chases us. Yep. No matter how far we push it down, and that is where there's opportunity for growth. Um, it's never about the abuse. Is to serve some purpose. It's that there is some purpose that may be in the abuse, right. or, or or that that the cancer is going to cause something, you know, to to happen. God gave you this cancer for right. this reason. No, it's it's what God walks with you through that you can learn from right. having the cancer. Right. Um, and I think that's what I'm hearing you say that in this in this uh, musical is that where they find hope um, instead of struggling against the idea of why do I have cancer it's okay I have cancer now what am I going to do with this right. and and it's and it's that storyline of what they do with it mm -hmm. and all the hard hard parts of that um, and um, Andrew, I appreciate you being here. Um, as always, it's it's great to have a conversation with you. It's amazing. I've known you for a long time. I've known a lot about your story. And just like today, um, there's stuff that I learned uh, that I didn't know. Uh, and so I really appreciate you. Um, how if, if someone wants to if someone wants to go to this musical, um, Colors of Hope, uh, how do they do that? Where when is it? Where is it at? And and how do they get information? So to, so tell us a little bit of tell us a little bit about that first. 
first? The show dates are um, March 22nd through the 24th. Okay. So it is right around the corner. It is. Which is yep, really yep, scary. Yep. Um, we're performing at the Nordlaff Center downtown. Okay, downtown um, Rockford. Yep, it is a fundraiser for St. Jude's. So okay. um, uh, a good chunk of the proceeds are going to St. Jude's. Okay. Um, so that you know can help give people a little more purpose to come and see it. Um, if you want information, you can check out Gateway Performing Arts Studio on Facebook. Okay. Um, or you can look me up on Facebook and you know you can message me or um, uh, if you find my blog my contact information is there so they can message me on there and okay. I can give them information for Perfect. tickets and everything else too. Great. Well Andrew thank you for being here on the journey and um, as always as I mentioned before I enjoy listening to you talk about and having conversations with you. I'd, I'd like to have you on again as we as you continue your process and, and learning and um, and being the man that God created you to be. So uh, thank you again. Um, thank you for joining us today um, with this conversation on the journey and um, look forward to being with you next week. Thank you. Thanks.